but primarily the uh, program and signatures. And I decided we need to have some special programs about the nuclear chemical. Because not all of us have been in all of our lives. And I've been here for 22 years. And I think in a few more years I may be in the <laughs> Thank you. 
Constitution. Anyway, I was born in Sargent, Georgia, in September 25th, 1936. My daddy worked at the mill. My uncle, two of my uncles worked in the mill. A lot of my family worked in the mill. Matter of fact, during the Great Depression, a lot of my family worked in the, in the mill uh, in Sargent before the child labor laws were put in place. So I think my, my youngest uncle was about 14 years old when he worked in that cotton mill. But the, the uh, cotton mills that are going to Sargent and each one of around the county were the primary uh, source of the living for those people who were not farmers, and in a lot of cases, those people who were farmers. Uh, I grew up there in Sargent in my early years, but I love my grandmother and granddad and father so much, I spent every minute I could with them. They lived out in what is the handy, what's called the handy community today. today is, uh, where a part girl road and, and uh, Thomas Crossroads and that, and he was helping them all come together. But typically, uh, my, my, here's, here's a good example. My granddaddy would get up in the morning and start a fire in the, in the stove, get the fire in the morning, he'd come back to bed, and my poor grandmother, she'd get up and, and cook breakfast every morning. A real, one, of my, one of my responsibilities for them, when I lived with them, that there was a big water tank on that stove. That's where they, they heated the hot water and washed the clothes and washed the dishes and whatever. Uh, and one of my jobs was keeping that, hot, that tank full of hot water. In addition, making sure the fire with the, the wood boxes full. But my grandmother would get up and uh, fix breakfast for, for all of us. My, my grandfather and my uncle and I would get up and go take care of the livestock and, and do, do all that stuff. And, uh, my, we, we got everything after breakfast, put everything up, we'd go to the field. And my, this is a very typical uh, role of a farmer's life. My grandmother would do the breakfast, you know, do the dishes, come to the field, and one way, I'm thinking that just chopping cotton is a good example. We were all there chopping cotton. She'd come and chop cotton. Uh, and around 11 o'clock, she'd quit go back to the house and cook, and cook lunch on dinner, as we call it back in those days. And, and then we'd come back to the field with us that afternoon and come back to the house and, and cook supper and go milk the cows and feed the chickens and all that. Women back in those days, farm and farm women especially now, had a really hard life. Uh, and I grew my grandmother so working so hard so much. But one of my favorite things uh, back in those days was preparing corn to go to the, the whiskey. We've got this bar, and you know what I'm saying? The typical farmer has a big bar and they have all that corn stored in that bar. And we would take a break from the farming and stuff and go in and, and shut um, three or four bushels of corn, put it on the wagon, and take it down to the college crossroads where the grist mill was, and they would grind it for the, for the, for the meal, the corn meal. That's, that's where the corn meal came from. Uh, and they got, they got compensated for grinding that corn for the meal, and they would, they would take a portion of Four bushels of corn, they, they take a half a bushel of corn as compensation. But the, I enjoyed that, that because two things. One, I was out in the field and I was in the barn and shut the corn and don't do But we take the, when we take the uh, wagon load of corn down to the Bristol, we go about an hour's store there, and my grandfather would buy me a horse and corn. So that was a, that was a real treat. The, the uh, typical and in, 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 in cotton products, I can't begin to tell you how many days we spent in the field picking cotton. Um, I mentioned earlier about Mr. Miller Carter and the Chicago cotton. We, we, I 
couple hundred miles it is out there in the Haiti community, but it's a pretty good trip. But we, when we had a wagon load, when we felt, felt like we were taking the left cotton, the male cotton, you would load it on the, on the wagon, and you would wagon and come to me, you come to the down of this little college shore to, 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 uh, to share that cotton. Uh, and that was another great adventure. Ryan told me to sit up there on that wagon on top of that cotton while we were coming to the top of the tank. And my, and my, I spent a lot of time, I said, with my grandparents out in the country. But my, my dad and my stepmother were still living in, in, uh, in Sargent. And uh, one, of the, one of the great things at Sargent was the Sargent baseball team. I don't know if you've ever, if you've never been to Sargent, they, they, I, I haven't seen them lately, but they're in they, 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 they a park called Utah. It's a great baseball team. And I can remember so well how, how much everybody looked forward to the weekends because all those guys, all those guys were working the deal, they played baseball with the baseball team. And they had some great, great baseball teams. And that was kind of one of our sources of entertainment. But coming to Newton from the country or from Sargent to, to uh, my Selena Browns played baseball was another great addition. I don't know who was responsible for it, but somebody ran buses from Sergeant Narco into downtown Hill. You know, we would ride those, ride those buses to come and watch the Newton Browns play, play baseball. And uh, that was all of the country people really loved to come down and watch the Newton Browns play baseball. And occasionally we would go to Carroll and watch them. Play, it was way in Carolina. But uh, it was growing up in the country, with, there was a lot of, a lot of great things in that. We did a lot of hunting and fishing, as you might imagine. And Mr. Alice Pennison, who was one of those wealthy people in the room, he loved us to kill quail and bring them bring to him. Uh, it was not unusual for us to have three or four of us in the, in the woods in the field hunting, hunting quail, killing a dozen or more quail. And uh, we'd bring them to Mr. Benson and he, and he paid them for them. He paid, paid us for them. So we, we enjoyed that. Uh, we like to shoot the birds to get with them, but we like them pay us when we just <laughs> shoot the birds. Another thing we did for entertainment, for lack of a better word, uh, we, we lived, our, after, my, after my dad and I left, death, my dad left Sarge, we moved down a farm down on the river, down in the Chattanooga River. And we used to fish trot lines. If you're not a country boy, if you haven't been here a long time, you won't have any idea what a trot line is. But you put the line all the way across the river, and the hooks are about, about, about four feet apart as they go across the river. And we would, what we would do, we'd put the trot line out in the afternoon, and then we'd go, we'd go sand little creeks and little streams and get crawfish and venice to use them as bait on, on the trot line. Uh, and during the course of the night, we would, we would fish that trot line about two or three times. Uh, and, and of course, we had the big, what we call a fish box where we would save the fish. and, and um, uh, in the morning, we'd go back and fish it again. And just like the quail, there were people in Europe that, that loved those fish. Yeah, that was before the city of Atlanta was dumping all the garbage in, in the Chinese room. Uh, they loved those fresh catfish that we would catch them. That was another way that we, that we made our money. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the things that, that uh, I didn't like to do but my daddy made us do it. After we, after we laid the cross line, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with far words, when you lay by the crop, that's the last time you plant. You, you plant it in the spring and you plow it from April to June to keep the ground soft and the roots will grow and keep the weeds out and everything. After we, after we laid, the last time you plow, you lay, you call it, it's called laying by, laying the crop by. After we laid by the crop, we had a big old truck. 
and my family had a contact in Atlanta with a company called Dupree Manufacturing who would buy pulp wood. And we used to, uh, every morning, go, go to the woods and start cutting down pines with hand saws. Uh, but we didn't have no damn power saws. We had hand saws. Uh, and we would cut, uh, I don't know, in the course of the day, we'd probably get two truckloads of ply of uh, wood, uh, uh, of wood. And there was a, there was a, still there today, a railroad station in Sargent where they would park a flatbed train car and we would take that that pump wood there and, and put it load it load it on that on that uh, on that flatbed car. And that was another way that my daddy made made a little bit of money so that um, we got money to get back. But I failed to mention after he after he moved, after he, he moved us in that far down the river. He and my stepmother Beer, they continued to work the second shift at Sergeant while we while we did all that farm. Uh, one of my most um, unpleasant memories was I, I, I went I went to Welton. I don't know what we call it Western back in those days. That's Welton, but it was a high school. We went all the way through the eleventh. That's what eleventh grade was. It's high school then. And I played baseball. I was a pretty good baseball player. We had this, we had this big game coming up, and uh, we had a field of uh, peppers, and the, the weeds were kind of sort of taking over. My dad made me stay home from school on a day where we had to uh, have a really important baseball game to plow that damn pepper field. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, as mad as I was, I got the view when I went over there and started to plow. And the ground was real soft and sandy. So I was so angry that I, I put that plow as deep as it would go. Uh, and after about an hour of plowing like that, that, we got to the end of the row, one, one of the rows, and the poor old people just fell over because it, it, it was so tired and so worn out. But I was so, I was so mad, mad, I didn't care about the, about the view. But my, the bad news is, my daddy showed up about 15 minutes after that new fellow. Um, and I won't go into the details of what, what happened after that. But uh, uh, the, other, the other really entertaining thing that we did was possum hunting. Uh, not many of you know what a possum is, but, but we, we, had some, we had some great hound dogs. Uh, and we'd go out in the woods at night and they would, they would hit a trail where a possum had been on the ground and, and as the dogs would ask the possum to go up the tree and the dogs would, would what we call tree the possum. Uh, depending on the size of the tree and the limbs and so forth, we might just walk away and leave that, that possum there, but more, more, more often than not, we, we got the possum. And uh, since possums were critters that ate, ate anything they could get their hands on, we had possum houses back at the farm where we put those possums in, in the possum houses and, and feed them good solid food to get all the bad stuff out of their system before my grandmother would cook them. Uh, uh, <laughs> possum and <laughs> Possum and Parker. Possum We're pretty good. <laughs> People in the country uh, depended so much on the, on the people with money in the city to get by from, from, uh, from one part of the year, from the planting of the crops, and the harvesting of the crops, and the selling of the crops. And one of the things that I really love to do with my granddaddy Cogman, when the watermelon, when the watermelons were getting ripe, we would we would take the wagon over to the watermelon patch load the wagon up with watermelons and come to you and go a mule driven uh, uh, wagon full of watermelons and park it right down by First Baptist Church and we'd sit there all day on Saturday and, and sell watermelons off that, <laughs> off that wagon. Uh, it, it's, it was amazing how inventive and how creative the farmers could be to, to, to generate enough Revenue to, to 
uh, they thought of Reverend back those days called money. Uh, <laughs> to, 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 to survive. Uh, I see how thrifty people the, the, the farmers were the country work. Uh, you buy a, a sack of fertilizer, back in those days, a sack of fertilizer or a sack of caffeine um, was in a cloth bag. My grandmother, after the bag was empty, my grandmother would take that bag uh, and wash it real good. You know, we, we had wash pots back in those days where you put stuff in the water and wash it really. And she made, she made sheet, bed sheets out of those bags. That's what she did. And in and, and a few cases, she made my uncle, Ace, who was the younger son, she made his underwear. <laughs> um, so that's just another example of how creative, uh, I'll say creative and desperate. Um, the thing, another one of the things I look forward to most was the rolling store. I don't know if any of you all ever heard of the rolling store or not. But there was a man by the name of Mr. Chambers who had a rolling store, and in that store he had just about every kind of commodity you could think of that you use for cooking. And, and he would, about, I think, about one, once a week he had a route, he, he came to everybody's house. And my grandmother would, would make um, churned butter, make butter, and, and, and take the eggs that she had gathered, and things like that, and swap those to uh, Mr. Chambers for the, the merchandise that she needed, everything from salt to, to uh, in some, many cases, flour and stuff like that. And Mr. Chambers would take those. But my grandmother, would, on the day that we knew Mr. Chambers was coming, my grandmother would turn me loose to go find chicken, chicken nests that she didn't know about. Because back in those days, there were chicken nests and they to, to the chicken house. And that's where, you, that's where they collected most of the eggs. Uh, but there were a lot of loose eggs around. And she would let me go look for the loose eggs. And again, it's a fish where I would uh, swap Mr. Chambers' eggs with R.C. Cole. I don't really sell R.C. Cole to take back on those things. Those, those were the big thing. And the other, the other uh, thing that was so important to the farmers back in those days was the ice cream. Uh, all, all the country people had uh, wooden ice boxes. They were insulated wooden ice boxes. And depending on the size of the ice box, you could put 50 pounds, 75 pounds, 100 pounds of ice in those ice boxes. And uh, when, we, when we knew that the, the, the ice cream was coming, we almost would celebrate when we sat ice in there and we would have some ice in our teeth. But my grandmother being the independent person she was, she knew that my granddaddy and my uncle Mason looked like Joe. And we had a, they had a very deep well. And she would put a mix of jello and put it in a, in a water bucket and put it down in the well where it was cold and, and the jello would gel down, down, in, down in the well. Otherwise, it was not very much way to, to gel the jello. Uh, I can go on with these kind of stories. Uh, uh, I, I love it. I love my grandparents. Uh, another, another story is we, the school bus, they lived a mile and a half on Cogget Road, and the most story was about a mile and a half. And the county would not require the school bus driver to come down to our house and get to walk over to the most story road and the school bus. And one day I got off the school bus and my grandmother was standing there with my home. And I went over what was going on. Well, a mad dog had been spotted that afternoon. In case you don't know what a mad dog is, that's a dog with rabies. So my grandmother was not going to let me walk that mile and a half from the bus, right off the school bus, to the house and possibly for that, for that mad dog to be out there. So she, she made sure she was going to take me and protect me. 
I was six years old, I went from school at the barbershop and hanging around the barbershop with Daddy. And invariably, somebody would say, here, honey, take this five, take this nickel and go down to the drugstore and get yourself a nice cream. And I would just go down to the drugstore and get my ice cream and come back up there and hang around the barbershop. Well, one day, one of the influential people that he was talking about was getting his hair cut. And, well, before that, I had walked in one day and nobody offered me anything. Nobody said anything. So I finally said, isn't anybody going to give me a nipple? <laughs> <laughs> so, and my daddy took me to the back of the ball shop and he said, let me tell you something. You do not ever say that. I've got money. I'll give you money. You just let me don't ever, don't ever embarrass me like that. So it was a while before he let me come back to the <laughs> I was in the ball shop, and one of the men, one of the wealthier men, was Daddy's cutting his hair. And I can still hear this. He said, Darling, here's a dollar. Go down and buy your doll a dress. And I said, you just keep your money. My dad's got more money than you do. He'll give you money if I need <laughs> So I didn't get to go back to the ball shop. Because <laughs> we had, Daddy always, Daddy took, Daddy made me his son. I went fox hunting with him and I went bird hunting with him and I learned to shoot a gun. We would always get the Atlanta paper and it had a, um, they had a big, magazine section they call it. And it was always maybe the governor or the president or somebody would be on the front of it. And daddy would put it up on the tree and let me shoot the eyes out of the house. You know the boys that I you know wanted to shoot. And I, I learned that um, daddy had fox hands on he raised fox hands and that's what but now you think of fox hunting as riding these horses and these all that. If well, that wasn't the way it was, no. What you did, you loaded up the dogs and you turned them loose and then you listened to hear them when they treated the fox or when they got out of one. Daddy would say, look at that, that's old Rachel. You can hear, you know that's Rachel. No, that's Ruby. I think that's Ruby doing that. Well, I went every Thanksgiving morning and get up before dawn and go to a fox hunt. And then I went with Sherry and Mama Potts and my daddy, Mr. Walter Sanders, they all had the fox pants and we all went, and I would go look. And the men always had the cigars or the cigarettes or whatever. And daddy would get me some racket back and load it up in, in a brown paper bag, but I'd smoke the racket back here. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing the fox hunt, so I was just one of the game. <laughs> But um, I, I remember so well, Christmas was such a special time for us back in the 40s. And see, we, we had the war going on, and Daddy was what they called an air raid war. Um, during that war, during World War II, we had to, we heard the sirens go off. You had to put the shades down, turn off all the lights, and there could be no lights. And Daddy would, for his street on Jefferson Street, he would take his flashlight and check the house to be sure all the lights were out. We had a we were ration, we had, I still got my book, but gas was rationed, sugar was rationed. But you know, I never felt poor. I never felt like that we were deprived of anything. I, the first bicycle I had was a bicycle that was was a, a used bicycle that the fire department people would take old toys to the fire department and they would refurbish them and then we and I, so my first bicycle was somebody else's bicycle. I thought that was the greatest gift I could have had. And like I said, we never really felt like you know that we were deprived. But the war years were hard, and I know that my mother and daddy 
both struggled because they didn't have a lot of money. The day making his amount of money that he was making for a half but you can imagine, he worked late every Saturday night. And I just want to show you, I've, I've got all of the old phone books. <laughs> now this is 1953, uh, 1952. And I want you to see how few pages of people that had phones in them. And the first phone we had was a party line. Mm -hmm. And our number was, we were on the party line, and our number was 1239J. And um, you pick up your phone. You didn't have one phone. It was out in the hall. And you pick it up, and the operator would say, number please, and you get to tell them what number you want. And if somebody was on the other line, if you could, you tried to listen to what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the mother come along, you can't do that, you know, make me hang up. So you waited until they got through with that phone call, and then you could make yours. And I never will forget, Grandpa had, had one operator one telephone operator, and her name was Ruth. And so I had a friend who, who lived in Grandville, and I would call her number, and Ruth would say, Janelle is not at home, she's at the drugstore, and you want me to have her call <laughs> when she gets back from the drugstore. And so then we were lucky to get a straight line, and it was one, two, three, one. That was our telephone number then. And then later on, you know, they went to Alpine 3. That was the, the next thing after just plain numbers. And now look at what we've got. <laughs> <laughs> but this little book, I was looking at some of the, some of the numbers in here, and it, it's just really interesting. The stores, Dixie Shoe Service, call 755. And, <laughs> Quality Shoe Repair and Lane Shop, and they had an 86 radio cab company. You could call 86 and they could send a cab to pick you up. Um, we had, we had a, after high school, during the high school games, everybody went to football games on Friday night. That was just the thing you did. And we didn't have a um, field. Newland High School. We were over on Western Street. Over Pickett Field was the name of it. And the gym was the gym that's over there now. And uh, I had, I think I had maybe about 30 teachers is all that were in the high school. All of my female teachers were single except for one. Ms. Eddings was principal's wife. And she did the library, and Mr. Evans was our principal, Mr. O.P. Evans. And I'm going to tell you something. When he came on that loudspeaker, God was talking to him. <laughs> he didn't say nothing. I mean, what he said, you did. Ms. Evans kept the library, and if you went in and checked out a book, First of all, girls had to take off their bracelets. We couldn't wear bracelets because we'd mess up a table. We might scratch a table. So we had to leave our bracelets with her. And then, if you checked out a book and you brought it back, she went through it page by page. And if you turned down a page or if you marked in that page, you went straight to the principal's office. And I need to tell you, we. We, crawled, we did the line right there. And it was funny, I've been over to the high school uh, once a semester now to tell them about my days in Newman High School when, I, when we first got over there. And those children, they cannot believe what we, the dress code, the, the teachers, the women teachers wore suits or dresses and high heels. The men wore coats and ties, and the boys could never wear shorts. I mean, they wore long pants, and the girls couldn't wear jeans, except we could wear jeans on Saturday to go to the picture show. We had two picture shows, and I know y'all probably lose with the picture shows to me, 
there was an Alamo in, in the gym, and we would go there. And we always went after school sometimes, and on Saturday morning, they had a cowboy movie. We always met to go to the cow see the cowboy movie. And so we, we lived, a, it was a simple life. Everything was simple. And <coughs> when you went downtown, you know, I, we called it uptown. I went uptown. I didn't go downtown. I went uptown. You go, it was one way street. I mean, one, one lane. You didn't have two lanes. And I remember one of the older women, she had a big old Cadillac. And when they changed it over, and she wanted to get, they made it double lanes, and she wanted to get over here in this lane, she'd be in this lane, she'd peck on one that say, coming over. Coming over. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, she calls more squeaking of brakes. She never would give a signal and she never did load the hand out. And so anyway, we finally learned to do the two lanes down at the top. But the street, Jefferson Street ended where um, Hillcrest Chapel is, the bridge thing. And when I was a little girl, my daddy would come home from the barber shop and take me down to the bridge to watch the train go under the bridge. That was my what we all we always went down to see the train that came through. And after the bridge, it was peach orchards and cotton fields and dirt road, and it was just. No traffic. <laughs> no traffic. And I never will forget when they decided to make make the curve there at the cemetery and widen all that. We were having what they call the follies. We used to have the follies. The junior league would put on the follies. And it, we had the best time doing that. Well, there was an older woman, older than me, if they can believe it. But anyway, she didn't care what she said. And she was in the, she was doing the Annie Main thing. She was in the chorus line. She was kicking her legs this way and kicking her legs that way. <laughs> and she just stepped out in the middle of that and said, personally, I liked Jefferson Street the way it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> she right there. <laughs> You know, I think now, trying to go out, well, I told one of the state troopers, they may name, name it Bull, Bullsboro, but to me it's bulldozed. They bulldozed everything I ever loved out that way. And it, I, I know change is good, and I'm, I'm glad we've had changes, but I feel like sometimes unity has exploded rather than gradually gotten to what, you know, and I I don't like I don't like what I'm seeing in a lot of ways, but growing up in the forties and the fifties was a treasure. And it really was. And my book, if if you've seen it, if you've read it, or um, look at it, I've written a lot about the the stores that used to be downtown and in, in uptown New York. And, we had grocery stores. Everything you wanted was right in in the town. The courthouse square. <laughs> right around the courthouse square. And I'm thankful they preserved the courthouse. We're so lucky that they preserved it and they're using it because I was on the committee. And I know that they were thinking about letting it maybe be a museum or something. And I was so afraid if they didn't use it, then we... They, the county wouldn't keep it up, you know, and it wouldn't be kept up. But it, it's a it's a grand and glorious place. So thank y'all and I enjoy it. Thank you. Yes. So you were in the county, you were in the city. Did did you did the kids get together? I mean, did did you intermingle at all? Um, Every, everybody, a lot of the kids in the county, like people I knew as sergeant, the, uh, the supervisors, they wanted their kids to go to Newton High School or so they had to go to, to welcome a sergeant. But there was a, there was a, 
a divide between, mm -hmm. between the two. Well, was that the people of greater means? Well, the money was all in you. But even if they lived in Sargent or Welcome, they were able to send their kids to Gamertize. They, they, it took a lot of duty to make that happen. <laughs> well, when, now, when I was in, in high school, we had a lot of, a lot of my friends lived in Arnica and Sargent. A lot of them did, and they, they, you know, and they were on the football team, basketball teams. They, they had shut down past the eighth grade by then. Yeah. So yeah. they, they, yeah, they had to come in. Yeah. You're yeah. talking about Western Elementary now? That was then the high, it went through high school? Yes, it was. When I was going to school, we welcome well from that Western. The, back in those days, high school ended in 11th grade. Hmm. And, and that one school Western, went? Western Elementary. We went to the they were grade. precocious in those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I remember, I remember in the graduating class before I graduated, there were like 18 students in the graduating class. And is that because of the fact that there was so much Thanksgiving, he would bring all these turkeys and 
wild turf, uh, just turkeys. And he would get up on the roof of the thing, and everybody would get down the street, and he would throw those turkeys off and see them get that Thanksgiving turkey that way. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> throwing off those turkeys off the roof. Where did, did, did all of this take place? Where did all of this take place? 
because he was trying to say that it happened in very well camp. But the law said that he was killed in very camp. So he said, now where did this take place? And then he went way back and said, everything that happened happened in Mayberry County. <laughs> Thank you. 